Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first Google Hangout we're doing for Cultured Food Life. And I am really excited that we have so many people from all over the world coming to this um, Google Hangouts. And I'm excited. I see all the questions in the sidebar here. And I'm super excited about that. And uh, we're going to be answering some questions. But first, I want to talk just a little bit about cultured foods and um, how important they are for everybody to be eating and consuming cultured foods. First of all, if somebody asked me if this was a, a fad or you know something that's new that's going to go away. But cu cultured foods have been around for a very, very, very long time. Hi, everybody. Time. Welcome. So. I am really excited. I got to talk to my guy here, Chris. Or is am I doing this right? Because I'm coming on delayed. Is this all right? Is everything doing okay? I'm just checking with him to make sure that the audio is coming on. Yeah, you're good. And I paused it. Is that okay on my screen? That won't mess anything up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just leave that paused. Okay. So anyway, let me go back to what I was saying. We're we're this is we're new to this, so excuse us if we have a few little bumps along the road. But I wanted to tell you that this is something that has been around for thousands of years. And so many, many people um, are afraid of cultured foods because we have been trained in a completely different mindset today than we were um, years ago. These, these foods were around to preserve our food and make them safe. That's why they used cultured foods. Um, they loaded the foods with good bacteria, preserved them, and made them safe to consume and they became safer than foods that are raw or organic that were things like that they are still safer to eat cultured foods because of the good bacteria in them you literally can't get sick from cultured foods because it's scientifically impossible you have to heat all of the food and kill all the bacteria and then the only thing that can survive is botulism that's what you do in canning and the only bacteria that can withstand heat is botulism. If all the other good bacteria are in there, they would dominate, and botulism could never get a foothold. So you never heat cultured foods and then cap off the air and can them. So scientifically, it's impossible to be sick from cultured foods. And you and I are trillions upon trillions of good bacteria. And when you eat these foods, all of these processes in your body start firing up again because have you noticed how people are getting sicker and sicker? That first it was the adults, and they started getting sicker as they aged and got older. And then it's and now it's the younger people, and now it's children. And it seems like it's epidemic everywhere that people have got stomach issues, allergy issues, all kinds of problems, their autoimmune diseases, asthmas, all kinds of problems. And it's because every generation is getting further and further away from these types of foods and we're eating processed foods and foods that aren't good for you and so every generation of child is getting sicker because you get your good bacteria from your mom when you're born you get that through the when you go through the birth canal or even walking around the hospital with nurses and as we all decline in the amounts of good bacteria we have um, our bodies start to decline because we don't have the things we need to digest our foods to absorb the nutrients from our food and we start having allergies and asthma and all kinds of problems. So the really exciting thing is this is not a fad. It's been around for thousands of years and you cannot believe what can happen to you when you start consuming small amounts of these foods. This is not just about changing your diet. This is about changing your gut, which changes your brain, which changes the way that you feel, which changes your life. And that is what happened to me because I was so sick. I didn't know that I could feel so good. I didn't know that. I had no idea that this was how I was supposed to live. We had gotten so far away from that and I had so many problems. So as little by little as I began to consume these and started to feel better, everything changed for me. Everything. And I wound up here having a website and a business and teaching classes and writing books and I had no intentions of ever, ever, ever doing that. And so that's what happens to you when you start to feel good. You connect to, your gut connects to your brain, which they call your second brain, and makes those feel-good chemicals that makes you feel really alive inside, makes you feel joy, and then you start to really live the life 
that you deserve and were meant to live. So if I can help you do that, I would be seriously excited about that. Because if everybody could go from where I was to how I feel now, my goodness, it would change the world. Because that is extraordinarily how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live these lives that we really are meant to live joyous, happy, healthy lives. So every day, if you didn't have any health problems and you didn't have to worry about being sick, what would you do with your life? What could you go out and do today if you never had to worry about that again? This is what happened to me. Look at all the things I'm doing. I wasn't doing any of this before. So I'm excited to hear your stories. And I'm excited that so many people have written in and asked questions. So I am going to um, start answering some of these questions. And I want to show you, I am drinking kombucha, my own kombucha here. Um, this is, my daughter Macy makes this. This is grape. And I have some Fig Newtons that I made with sprouted flour here that I wanted to show you guys. So I'm going to have to post this recipe there. Aren't these cute? They're sprouted flour, and I made I found figs in the fridge yesterday. I made those. I wish you guys could all come over. I would give you some. I have some cultured vegetables here in my jar. Have you seen the RJ kraut? I have these here, and I wanted to show you those. And we're going to talk about all of these cultured foods. So let me get to some of the questions. If I answer your question, um, you need to send an email to uh, support, support, S U P P O R T, at culturefoodlife.com. Tell them their, your Biotic Pro username, the question you asked, and you will receive a free gift. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to go to the first question. How can I sneak kombucha and cultured veggies into my children's food? And will heat kill the probiotics? Heat will kill the probiotics. Above 115 degrees, it starts to kill them. Uh, warm is okay. Below that is okay. But the, the biggest thing that kills probiotics is heat. That's why they pasteurize milk, because it kills bacteria. Although I believe raw milk in, is a wonderful thing, um, but it's that's one of the things that they use to um, that they've used for years to kill bacteria. So anytime you heat your cultured foods, you kill them. And how to sneak kombucha and cultured vegetables into my children's food? Well, nobody was pickier than my family, so I know all about sneaking and not telling people what they're eating for many years. And I still, to this day, will tell people just to try things. For instance, my uh, little girl yesterday, um, I, we make smoothies a lot every day. And for, for a long time, she didn't like kombucha. So I found a way to make a smoothie. She liked to keep her smoothies. And the way that I make my smoothies for her when she was really picky was I would take half a cup of kefir, half a cup of coconut milk, because she liked coconut milk or almond milk or even regular milk, so that it would dilute the kefir taste. So it was half coconut, half kefir, I would put a couple tablespoons of kombucha in it, and which makes a smoothie super, super bubbly. I mean, it, it makes it like a milkshake. And then I use like lemon or vanilla extract because that kind of gives it a, a better flavor. And then fruit or stevia. She liked bananas. Um, sometimes I just put lemon extract and stevia in it and lots and lots and lots of ice. And she, to this day, that's one of her favorite smoothies. And she got kombucha and she got... Uh, kefir in it. And, and then sometimes I would put a teaspoon of, of uh, cultured vegetable juice from the RJ crowd in there. I actually did that yesterday. She doesn't know it. <laughs> I actually did that. So she's getting the Trilogy in a smoothie. And you don't need very much for kids. I mean, you need spoonfuls. That is a great way to sneak. We could, I should write a blog about that. Trilogy smoothie. That would be, you put all of them in there. Kombucha, kefir, and cultured vegetables. Just put a little of the cultured vegetables and you can't taste it. And um, it's, that's, that's one of the fastest and easiest ways to uh, get those into your diet. And um, your name is eight, let's see, Anon 811890. And if you will write support at culturedfoodlife.com, um, I will send you some of my airlock jars. Um, have you seen the big half gallon? This one, if you would like a half gallon airlock jar, send me an email and we'll get that out to you. Okay, the next question, Anon7641, these are anonymous names, so uh, you'll have to put in your Biotic Pro username when you send an email to us. I have several store-bought kombucha bottles. Can I reuse them? Yes, 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 yes. I use them all the time. Actually, my daughter Macy uh, makes kombucha for all kinds of people. People come and buy it from her all the time. And that's the one of the main things she does is uses the... Um, 
GT Synergy kombucha bottles are terrific for that. And they're safe because they're made for kombucha. So they're a wonderful um, thing that you can reuse. And they actually clean up in the dishwasher pretty good because I've used them many times in the dishwasher. And so they have, they have all kinds of um, different bottles now and different kombuchas at the stores. And the only one I've found that I don't really like is um, kombucha, the wonder drink, because it's pasteurized. So it's not really kombucha. So I, I kind of got leery when I saw that it was on store shelves and not refrigerated. So then I discovered that it was actually pasteurized and not really. So if you pasteurize something, you kill the bacteria, so you're really not getting a live drink. So that is the only thing. And if you will send us an email, um, I will send you, uh, if you'd like a, co a signed copy of my book, I could send you a signed copy of my book. So just send in your email and we'll get that out to you. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we've got another question. Let's see what this is. This is a good one. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I don't have much of an appetite since I started drinking Kefir. Is this a common occurrence or could I be detoxing? Yes, that is that is something um, I love that about uh, these cultured foods. They do kill your appetite a lot of times, and you know why? This is what's really cool about it. It's because they are so nutrient dense. Like for instance, um, when people who are uh, in this country, we are overeating a lot of processed foods, lots of these foods, and yet people are really becoming overweight and struggling with those things because they're really not eating foods anymore. They're, they're just eating foods that are lacking nutrients and lacking all kinds of nutrition in them. So they're hungry all the time, so they're wanting to eat. Well, when you eat cultured foods, they have so many nutrients in them that they kill your appetite because you're full. And honestly, to be honest, I only, I only eat like two meals a day. I'm just not hungry anymore. Um, that's one of the nice things is that I just have found that because these foods fill me up, I don't need as much food as I used to. And here's a really cool thing that has happened to me. Um, as I've gotten older too, I've noticed I, I really, I'm not needing as much sleep. And I didn't know if something was wrong or if if I was, you know, I didn't know because I, I just need five, six hours of sleep and I'm good. Well, when you're not eating as much, your body uses most of its energy through digestion. These foods are pre-digested. They're, they're wonderful. They are pre-digested foods that take very little for the body to, you know, break down because they're already broken down. And so I found that I didn't need as much um, food to eat, and I never need the sleep that I used to use. And But I changed my diet and start eating those other foods and don't eat as many cultured foods, I, I seem to need more sleep. Especially if I eat anything that is sugar or processed, I sleep more. That's what I've noticed. So um, there, that's a real, and I, I've heard that from a lot of people. Kombucha is the one thing that I think that helps me um, the most with that was that killed my appetite and uh, really that's the story GT's mom who wrote who does Synergy Kombucha he's the one that sells the kombucha in the stores GT Synergy Kombucha his mom was drinking kombucha for weight loss and because um, it killed her appetite and she discovered she had just started drinking it about a month when she found that she had stage 4 breast cancer and um, she was just floored that um, she had that, so they, which is really, it was a very bad form of it. They opened her up and found that she, that the cancer cells were dormant. And they sewed her back up and said, we don't know what you're doing, but you need to keep doing it. Um, and uh, whatever it is that you're doing, and the only thing she had been doing different was drinking kombucha. So that is that, because he felt like it saved his mom's life. He uh, he decided to make it and sell it. That's what he did. So that's his story. You can see that on my site on kombucha. And also, we have a new dog that I think is tearing up a book right now. We have a new puppy named Scoby. Come here, Scoby. Come here, Scoby. Come here. I can hear him tearing something up over there, and I'm afraid it's my book. So um, I had it sitting over there. But anyway, we have a new dog named Scoby. We love kombucha so much we named our dog Scoby, which is 
um, the little mushroom, or they, really it's not a mushroom, it's a combination of bacteria and yeast that you put into your culture to make it. So if he comes over here, here's Kobe. I'll have to show you him. He's pretty cute. I, I have a story about him too that I wanted to tell you because we're talking about kombucha. Um, cultured foods are so good for dogs. They are unbelievably effective. And I am getting ready to post another blog too about some dehydrated scobies that you use, that you make, you get your scobies from making kombucha, dehydrating them, making them for dogs. And I have a new recipe that I wanted to post on there. But when we first got SCOBY, which was a few weeks ago, um, he had a lot of sinus problems, or he was breathing, and I don't know. I've heard of things like kennel cough and, and things like that, and we didn't know what it was. And it had gotten so bad, we were getting ready to take him to the vet. And I started giving him kefir and everything, and he was just uh, really struggling to breathe. He seemed like congested, like he had a really bad cold. And so when I first started giving him cultured foods, um, I noticed that uh, he started to like sneeze more. More stuff was coming out. And now is so greatly diminished that um, it's going away. And what is one of the emails I get on a regular basis are for animals and how effective they are for cultured foods. He, they, animals really, really thrive. And I really, really encourage you to give your dogs keeper. Um, because they help so many problems, and animals get better so quickly. I've even got a story about a cow. This one girl came to my class, started making kombucha for her family. The neighbor's cow was really, really sick, and so she uh, decided to take the cow. They were going to get rid of the cow, and so she said, well, can I have the cow? So she started taking the cow. She gave the cow kefir, and the cow transformed, and now there's nothing wrong with the cow. It's perfectly well, and the neighbor can't believe it. So, it, and I've heard of it fixing pigs, it cats, dogs, everybody. So, if you have an animal, I highly um, encourage you to feed them kefir. And actually, Scoby was likes my kombucha when he was he sits there and whines for it. And I haven't really fed him a lot. Sometimes I've given him cultured vegetables, but all those things are good for animals if they'll eat them. Sometimes they're a little vinegary. So, anyway, that is the well. The question that I answered for her was about the com, um, the kombucha bottles, you can send an email to us too and we will get you, if you'd like my DVD, the trilogy, I'd be happy to send you that. So let's let's look at another question. Um, okay, this is a, there's a lot of advice about not consuming dairy products. Does kefir react differently in the body so as not to cause music, mucus or allergic reactions? First of all, kefir is a very, very, very different food from regular dairy. And dairy and so many foods have become the enemy. Um, wheat, dairy, all of these foods have become the enemy. And rightfully so, because our dairy today is very different from the way that it used to be made. And even the cows are different, the way that there's, there's a difference in the type of cows they're breeding now. So yes, dairy is a very difficult thing to digest unless it's kefir. Because when you put kefir, which is a good bacteria, into dairy, you transform that milk. It, it, regular raw milk is supposed to have vitamin C and vitamin B. And I drink raw milk, and raw milk I think is a great food. It's a completely different food than pasteurized dairy. And for instance, when they pasteurize dairy, they kill all the bacteria. They kill the enzyme you need to digest milk. The enzyme is in milk that you need to digest. And so they kill that when they pasteurize it. They kill the vitamin C, the B, and they have to put back some of those nutrients back in there. And then they homogenize it. And when you homogenize milk, you change the molecule structure of the milk so that the milk doesn't separate. Because raw milk will separate. The cream will go to the top. And they don't want that to happen. So what they do is they homogenize it. So they actually change the complete structure of the milk. Well, what happens when you do that is that those molecules change and the body doesn't recognize them. And so it can nick the arteries. It can do all kinds of damage um, because the homogenization um, has really made the food a foreign food to the body. It's really hard on the body. And so all these problems are ensuing because, first of all, we're missing the enzymes we need to digest milk. Because if you don't consume um, the enzyme you need to digest milk, you'll become lactose intolerant because you'll start, start missing the enzyme. So all of those problems go away when you, when you have kefir. Because the lactose is gone from the milk, 
and you have the enzyme to digest the milk even though you don't need it because the lactose is gone from it. You get the vitamin C back, the B vitamin, you take away all the milk sugars which the lactose is gone so if you're lactose intolerant it's 99% lactose free so you can consume it and then you have billions upon billions of good bacteria and it is just it's phenomenal. I know so many many people who consume kefir who can't touch dairy and then as they get better and they consume it they seem to be able to not be allergic to dairy anymore. That's I've seen that hundreds of times and so that's that's a wonderful thing about kefir. Um, I also like kefir made with coconut milk it is so delicious and coconut has different properties in it so if you are allergic to dairy or you don't want to drink dairy coconut milk kefir is fabulous for that and also coconut has properties in it that are really good for you because coconut has caprylic acid in it and it also has the same um, it has all kinds of the same nutrients in it that have I can hear my dog barking. He gets under the couch and then he can't get out. So it has all kinds of nutrients in it. The coconut milk does properties to help you with um, things like candida because caprylic acid is what kills candida in the body. So if you have candida problems and you don't, you're struggling with dairy, um, it is a really, really good idea to use coconut uh, kefir as your as your main thing for um, drinking kefir. And a lot of people start with that and then they move on to other things. Uh, goat's milk kefir is good. Um, any kind of milk. Almond milk kefir is good. The only one that I really don't like is soy milk. And because soy milk, I could write a book on that. There's so many things. Let me tell you this story. When I, I kind of got into the health craze, this was before cultured foods, and I started drinking a lot of soy milk because I had heard that it was good for you. Well, what happened was it, it messed up my thyroid. And because it has uh, phytoestrogens in it. So it has all kinds of, come here Scoby, come here. It has all kinds of different phytoestrogens in it that can affect your thyroid. And it lowered my thyroid. So anyway, I stopped drinking the soy milk. And then my milk, I mean my thyroid, after I started, stopped drinking the soy milk, my thyroid went back to normal. And I had the same happen with my sister Debbie. She had, um, all kinds of her thyroid diminished when she started drinking soy milk and then when she went off of it it went back to normal. So I've always been a little leery. I think fermenting it would make it better but I I really there's so many other things that soy can cause problems with. I just highly uh, because of the estrogens in it I I think that it's best to stay away from it. So that that's just my personal opinion on dairy and Send us an email after your question, and if you would like, um, if you don't have kefir grains, I would be happy to send you some of my kefir grains. And when I do my kefir grains, I have a little booklet with it that shows you how to make it. And I have them in little jars because I'm pretty careful about, I'm really careful about how I ship my kefir grains. It gives me great anxiety to do this. So anyway, um, that would, I would be happy to send you some if you don't have some. If you don't, if you do have some and would like something else, we could figure out, figure out that. And you have to, honey, give me Scoby because I want to show up everybody the, the dog that's making all the noise. Come here, Scoby. Come here. Come here. He has got, he, we call him, he's got, uh, he's got more treats in his little box and he likes all things cultured. So someday when you, uh, when you think about animals, you think about all the things that, that are good for you. They're good for animals too. So cultured foods are one of the best things for children, animals. Let me show you my little guy that's causing, he's under the couch, this is Scoby. He's brand new puppy and we're still training him and he is a, uh, he is a puppy for sure. He's, he's into everything. So anyway, let's see, another question is, um, are there any foods that you have found that you don't like to culture? Well, um, Holly, come here, would you go get my, there's some uh, a jar of cultured vegetables in the kitchen counter. Would you get it for me? I have I have cultured one thing I didn't like, so I'm going to work on this recipe, but I was trying to make watermelon rind pickles. That's the only thing that I haven't liked so far. They're beautiful, and I can't throw them out, but I'm not crazy about them. Um, probably because you probably need to uh, pickle them for a long time, or lots of times before they make them and can them, they, they uh, boil them and uh, soften the rind, but that's about the only one that I have found 
that doesn't taste very good. But I, I've fermented just about everything, and I haven't found anything yet except for that that I didn't like. Um, there's, they, they ferment everything. So, but I have, if, if it's in a garden, if it's something you can grow, I've pretty much done it all. So, and I had, so I found these in the back of my fridge because I can't throw them out because they're perfectly preserved and they do so well. Maybe I brought them in here. Holly, you not see them in there? So, they're on the counter by the toaster, I think. So, we had, the fun thing is, there's got to be a way to do it, so I'll figure it out if there is, because you know how you have all the extra watermelon rind? I like to, they make pickles with the watermelon rind, so, so far not so good with fermenting, so we'll see. Maybe some, one of you guys has a, here's, here they are. I found these, they look pretty. You can see the pieces of the, they're still bubbly too, and they, I did them this summer. I don't know if you can see the bubbles. Can you see the bubbles? They look beautiful. I haven't tasted them for a while, but they didn't taste so good. They tasted too crunchy. They tasted like watermelon rind. So anyway, we'll see. If anybody has a recipe for that, let me know because so far that's the only one that hasn't worked for me. So let's see. Um, let's see. What is the best cow's milk to use for kefir? And send me an email and I will send you a gift. Uh, when you send me an email, maybe we could talk about what uh, you would like. So what is the best cow's milk to use for kefir, whole or 2%? Well, that is entirely up to you. You can use any kind of milk. You can use whole, skim, 2%, doesn't matter. Um, I like whole milk because it makes creamier kefir. 2% uh, is, is good too. Skim milk tends to make thinner kefir. And I'm not crazy about skim milk just because anytime you change the way nature makes something, you risk messing things up. For instance, for years, um, they told diabetics to only drink skim milk. And what happens when you remove the fat from milk, um, your body, if you're diabetic and you're, you're drinking milk, and fat and protein slows down your blood sugar. Well, they removed all the fat from the milk, and so they found that diabetics now that drink skim milk um, raises their blood sugar faster than if they, than they, if they drank whole milk. And so... I always kind of recommend that you stay with something that's more natural. You can certainly do that. It still works. I've done it. But I, I like whole milk, and I like raw milk the best. So those are, those are some of the things that I just learned through time. But it's up to you, your preference. You do what works for you. Okay, and send me an email, and I'll send you a gift. Um, let's see another one. I have... I added two ounces of juice to my 16-ounce bottle kombucha. Let it sit on the counter for three to five days in the refrigerator. My kombucha isn't busy as I'd like it to be. Okay, so let me talk to you about kombucha. Okay, the number one reason that your kombucha isn't busy is that you probably bottled it when it was too tart. It needs to be a tiny bit sweet when you bottle it because here's the deal. The good yeast that are in kombucha are going to eat the sugar out of your kombucha, and when they do, they make bubbles. But when they run out of food, they aren't busy. They're not going to be bubbly, busy. So it's either you have either bottled it when it was too tart, or your house is not very warm and it's going to take longer. My kitchen would get really cold in the winter, and it could take two weeks to get bubbly because my kitchen was so cold. Um, so if you can warm it up, Keep it at a warmer temperature and make sure it's not tart when you bottle it. That is the biggest tip with kombucha. That's the reason it's not bubbly. The sugars in the bottle will be eaten by the yeast. The yeast eat it and then they make probiotics. And so you don't get the sugar, you get bubbliness, and you get probiotics. So it's a win-win. So that's the main reason. Okay, let's do another question. Um, we have a lot of questions on here. Let's see. Uh, there are a lot of advice. I, I read that one. What is? Oh wait, I read that one too. Sorry. <laughs> are there are cultured foods and kombucha safe for severely damaged livers? Well, let me talk to you about kombucha. Kombucha is a very, very, very powerful liver detoxifier. And I did have some friends that had some liver problems. And they did really well on kombucha, but they needed to go slowly. But they did have a strong reaction to it at first. Like they, 
They got a little bit of a headache the first time they drank it. Uh, and headaches are caused a lot by the liver. And so as they detoxed, they got rid of, you know, all those problems went away. But I would go very slowly. Anytime you can help your liver, take stress off of it, reduce inflammation, um, have a powerful detox program that isn't going to stress it, and just do it in small amounts, it's a good idea to help out your liver. But to do it um, very, very slowly because it's, it's just part of this process. When you, when you first start consuming culture foods, you, you need to go slowly depending on how healthy you are. Um, for instance, I'll have to tell you the story of my husband. When we first started doing culture foods, I kind of went gangbusters a little bit. And I think I gave him, one day I gave him kefir and like I think it was a cup and a half of kefir, kombucha, and a whole bunch of cultured vegetables. And he had to stop at the gas station bathrooms five times on his way home. <laughs> he said nobody would go in after him, and he didn't know what had happened to him. But he basically got cleaned out all the way home from work. So that can happen because they will kill the pathogens. They will kill bad bacteria. That's what they do. That's what cultured foods, that's what good bacteria does. It goes in and kills the bad bacteria and removes it from the body so it can dominate and take over and be the predominant bacteria. For instance, it's really kind of cool when you know how bacteria works. So you guys really don't understand how much you are bacteria, more than cells in your body your bacteria. And they sense how big you are. Bacteria, this is what it does. It senses you the host that it's going to live in. And depending on all these different strands of bacteria, it will decide whether it can be dominant or not. And if it thinks it's got enough good bacteria, like say you start consuming cultured foods, if it thinks it has enough good bacteria, it will take over and dominate. And they will kill the bad guys and they will go bye bye they will be out of there but they will exit through the bowels the kidneys the skin um, you will notice you will notice a difference because they will start leaving um, it's called Herkimer reaction and that's really common with even with antibiotics when they when you kill things with antibiotics the die off effect from some of those harmful bacteria can can be uncomfortable that's a that's a normal thing they leave off toxins when the bad bacteria dies so sometimes it's best to go slowly and to just do one food at a time. And for instance, the thing I recommend the most is the trilogy, which is kefir, kombucha, and cultured vegetables. And the reason that I recommend that is because of the different strains of good bacteria in um, these foods that will really become the, the dominant um, ecosystem inside of you and it will take over it will colonize inside of you and it will start doing things that it hasn't been able to do before because now you have all this good bacteria that's going to control the environment and you'll notice that you'll have more energy that your digestion will improve that um, elimination improves everything has improved I mean for me um, allergies got better um, I have a story when I first started doing cultured foods uh, I was kind of all by myself, so nobody really knew about it. But I had a couple friends that um, their kids were sick, and so they started trying cultured foods because they were desperate. And one little boy had asthma, and she started giving him kefir. Well, he stopped needing his asthma inhaler, and he was he went through a whole season. He would have fall and spring when his asthma would be horrible, and so he'd have to use an inhaler. Well, he didn't need it anymore. And so it was great, and then they went through winter, and his mom kind of stopped feeding him kefir. And so spring hit, and one day this little boy stood in the kitchen and said, Mom, I, I need my kefir. I can feel it, because he was starting to have asthma again, because she had taken him off of it. And so she, her, his little body knew that he needed kefir, and he was seven years old. And she was one of the first people that I had talked to about cultured foods. And from that day to this, um, it made such a difference in her in their life um, that she she's been one of my biggest advocates now and it changed their lives so much that they don't go without it so and that's that's just one story and then I met a lady that came to my class she started giving her husband cultured foods and he too went off of his asthma 
inhaler. He hasn't had needed it. He's been using it for 27 years. And I hear these kinds of stories all the time. You guys don't hear them, but I do. And it is so amazing to me that something so simple as food could do this. I, it's thrilling to me because nobody wants to use an asthma inhaler. And it reduces inflammation in the lungs. And the, you know all of this inflammation that happens inside of the lungs um, is controlled even by bacteria. Because as you grow in numbers, these, these foods in your body, things start to really change for you. You, you begin to have joint problems that go away, the aches and pains. And that has happened to me until I'm to the point where I feel like I'm aging backwards. It's ridiculous. I'm like, my husband said to me the other night, he said, do you ever, you just don't, you ever going to go to bed? Because I'm, I'm just not tired. I just have so much energy to do things. And I don't, I don't have the physical problems that um, most people do or that I used to have because I used to be very sick too. So um, all of those things um, that reduce inflammation and that I think that there's diabetes has a lot of inflammation in it, high blood pressure has a lot of inflammation, all of these foods help reduce it and especially low kefir. That's one of the ones that works the best. So let me ask Husty another question. No matter what I do, I cannot get my coconut kefir to be thick and luscious. Any ideas? Well, I understand that because it depends on the type of coconut milk. The way to get your coconut milk thick and luscious is to use canned coconut milk. Or to use, I have a recipe on there, um, my coconut kefir is better than yours, and I use some of the coconut meat in my coconut milk to make it thick and creamy. Because most of the store, coconut milk you buy at the store is very thin it doesn't have the coconut meat in it, where canned coconut does, and so does the recipe I have on my website. And I think it's called, yeah, my coconut keeper is better than yours. You can see it under the dairy-free options. And it will get so thick and delicious when you make that. Um, I have a video on my site if you're a Body Pro member for chocolate coconut kefir pudding. It's to die for. It's every bit as thick as regular pudding, if not more so. But I used coconut milk in, a uh, canned coconut milk in it, and that's how I got it thick. So that that's what I would recommend. Or make my recipe and buy the coconut spread, and you add that to coconut milk in your blender, and it makes your coconut milk thicker. Um, it, and let's see, I read on your forum that you use kefir whey to preserve lettuce and other vegetables. Is this something other than fermenting them? Uh, I don't think I read, I don't think I wrote that. I think somebody else wrote that. I I haven't used kefir whey to preserve my lettuce and vegetables, but maybe somebody has. That's a good idea. It would preserve them. It would be great. Um, it, it is fermenting them because, well, you're not fermenting them. You're just preserving them. Let's put it that way. Because to ferment them, you'd probably have to take it out on the counter. It will still ferment a little bit in the fridge, um, but it's really preserving them. And that's a great idea. Let me tell you something about keeping things fresh like for instance like guacamole my guacamole never goes dark because I always put some juice from cultured vegetables in it so it always stays this bright vivid green and it's because it preserves the food um, the cultured vegetable juice has the enzymes and the good bacteria that preserve the food but the really cool thing about that is is that not only does it preserve your food it preserves you when you eat these foods what it's done to the the fruits and vegetables to preserve them happens to you. It makes you younger. It makes you feel better. It makes your skin glow because it's just it preserves things. It, that's that's its job. And so eating these foods, I think, makes you younger. I I'm getting ready to be 54 in about a week here. I can't believe I'm gonna be 54. <laughs> That freaks me out. I used to think those people were old, but I tell you what, I never felt like this in my 20s. Never, ever. And I, I think that if everybody knew this, my goodness, I don't, I don't feel like I'm aging. I guess I am, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like I'm going backwards. So, you know, I'm exercising more than I used to. I, I have more energy, and I think it's because these foods preserve me. They they make you last younger. And the funny thing is, in the very beginning when I started consuming culture foods, I had read that in, um, the Russians, I think it was, well, no, it was in the, in the mountains of Turkey, that they drank kefir all the time at their meals. 
and they had all of these people that lived to be over 100 there. And it really intrigued me. It's one of the things that made me try kefir because all these people were living well past into their hundreds without any of these problems, but this was something that they had with almost, kefir was something they had with, with lunch and dinner. And so, as and they were trying to figure out what it was, and they think that that was one of the things that they had so much of it in their diet. So I remember thinking, well, I want to live to be 100. So I started drinking it, and it, I'm starting to believe that that could be true because I've got a lot to do. So I would like to live to 100. So that's just that's my own personal theory. It's nothing scientific, but I'll tell you what, I never felt like this 20 years ago. So, and I've been doing this 13 years almost. Yeah, 13, 12 or 13 years, and it's night and day compared to what I was when I was younger. So, all right. Does second fermentation of coconut kefir need to be done with fruit? Or can you set it on the counter for another 24 hours without adding fruit after you take the grains out to increase the amount of good bacteria? Okay, let me talk to you about second fermentation. So, the reason that you second ferment your kefir, and if you don't know what that is, it's after you make your kefir, you take your grains out, and then you add fruit to it or fruit peel or something, and you let it sit out on your counter again for a little while, and then you place it in your fridge. And the reason that you do this is because you have to add something to it. You can't just let it, you can let it sit out again, but the bacteria doesn't have anything to eat. So the probiotics are not going to grow. You're not going to get the benefits of the folic acid and, and increased in the folic acid and the B vitamins as much because you're not giving the bacteria something to eat. Probiotics, whether they be in kombucha or in kefir, all need food to survive. So when you second ferment something and you give it a new food source like a piece of an orange peel, or a couple figs or something. You give it something new to eat, it wakes it up and it starts making more of what it already has because there's more bacteria in there to begin with. So yes, you do need to add something to it. You can let it sit out, it's not going to hurt anything, it's just going to get more sour and actually your probiotics will diminish because it won't have as much food and the benefits are not as great. So for instance, if you don't want to add fruit to your coconut kefir, add coconut. You would add pieces of coconut to it and it would work and it would second ferment. So, or don't second ferment it. And the other thing I want to tell you about too that I think is really important is like you don't need to second ferment very long. I think I have on my site like 12 hours. You can do two hours. You can do one hour. You can even just put it in the fridge with fruit after it's fermented the first time and it'll start to second ferment a little bit in the fridge. Um, and it doesn't separate as much if you put it in the fridge. But a couple hours, four hours, 12 hours, whatever you want just a little bit of time is going to make a big difference. So, and send me a, an email and I'll get you a gift. Um, let's see, do I need to transition the grains when I go from pasteurized homogenized to raw milk? Um, when I received your grains, I used pasteurized homogenized milk. After six weeks, I switched to raw. I switched between pasteurized and raw. Also, I store them in pasteurized because the raw is twice expensive. You do not need to do anything. You can switch them from raw pasteurized milk. Okay, and here's the thing about that. Here's Okay, so I actually think that it's a really interesting thing because bacteria likes room to grow. So when you put kefir grains into pasteurized milk, um, there's no good bacteria in there. So they grow like crazy because they can spread out and grow. Well, raw milk has some good bacteria in it, so they love raw milk but it, it, it tends, they don't tend to grow as fast because there's competition. Does that make sense? They still grow great, but I have noticed that they grow a little bit more if you put them in pasteurized milk for a little bit and then uh, switch them back to raw milk. It's an interesting thing. I still haven't quite figured out what's going on, but um, I've done both. It doesn't matter. They just want the lactose in the milk. That's what they want. They want to eat the lactose in the milk. Raw milk's always better, but if you can't afford it, Please do what you can afford because the benefits are many. You're going to find with me that I am, I am not very picky about things. I don't want to make this hard for you. Please don't think that you have to go buy fancy equipment. You can do almost all of your ferments except for maybe kombucha in canning jars like this. You don't have, I sell airlock lids and I love them. I think they work a little bit better, but you do not need them to make cultured vegetables. They make it better, 
but you don't need it. I would rather you just know that you can do it in a canning jar. You can even use a metal lid if you want. Plastic is better. But you can make your kefir in this. You can make your cultured vegetables in this. Please do it. I don't want to. You don't have to have fancy weights to weigh things down. You don't have to have um, special equipment. And people give all kinds of crazy advice. And that's exactly what it is. It's crazy. It's not hard. This is super easy. And I don't want to make it hard for you because you won't do it. And if you don't do it, you don't receive the benefits. And so if you are looking to start these foods, you just need a canning jar. That's all you need. And you can start making um, any of these foods if you have a culture. Um, kombucha, you need a, probably a bigger jar. You need like a half gallon to make it in. You need something that's going to hold three quarts of liquid. But, and you don't need a lid because you use a, a cloth and a rubber band. But I am not going to sit here and tell you you've got to buy the fancy stuff. Um, to do it. It works better, but it's it's fun. But, you know, I still do stuff in just canning jars because I don't have tons of lids. Well, I actually do now. <laughs> I sell them, but I uh, I still will stick them in jars that are like, for instance, these, the clamp down jars. See, these are cool, aren't they? I love cooking them in these because they're pretty. I'm not cooking them. I like putting them in these because they're pretty. So um, I have them in all different kinds of stuff. Keeper is super easy. You just Stick them in this jar with some milk, put a lid on it, and 24 hours later you got keeper. Strain it out, put your grains in new milk. That's how easy it is. And um, there's there's a million different people will tell you different way, but don't listen to them because they're just making it hard for you. And I've done this so long, I can help you be successful. It's my job. It's my job because if you're not successful and don't feel better and don't learn to do it, then um, you know I'm not doing my job because. This is something I really love, and I want to make a difference in your life. So simple is better. And no, you're not going to get sick if you don't use airlock jars. That's Just don't even get me started on that. That's a whole blog. But people are telling people if they don't use airlock jars, they're going to make themselves sick, and that's just ridiculous. Don't even listen to that. So they've been making these foods for thousands of years and didn't have airlock jars. So And we're all still here. So anyway, that's just my... I won't stamp my foot about that, but it makes me upset when people scare other people and tell them that they're going to get sick if they don't do it that way. And just so you know, when people tell you that, follow the money. Okay, I sell them too, but I'm not telling you you got to have them. So um, follow the money when in doubt. So if somebody's telling you you have to do it a certain way, just use your own judgment, but you don't have to have them. The other thing too, people want to know if you need weights to push the culture of vegetables down and things like that. And here's the deal with that. Okay, yeah, I used to use the cabbage leaves and roll them up, but then they would, and they would put, pick, take the cabbage leaves, roll them up, put them on top of culture vegetables and hold them down, but then they would smell because they would be above the water, the cabbage rolls that were rolled up, and I hated it. It had a horrible smell, and then they would get kind of a nasty yeast on them. And so I stopped using them, and then the weights were a pain because you had to dig them out, and it wouldn't hold them down. And so I found that the whole secret was if the vegetables are fresh, and the vegetables are, you know, at least partly submerged. I mean, the top may not be submerged, but you can open the jar and push them down, and you do not need all those weights and things. Um, just let them be. And the airlocks actually help with that, keeping the, you can get a, a, a film across the top. It's not a mold, it's a yeast. It's not dangerous, it's okay, but 99% of the time it happens because you're either not using culture or veg vegetables are not fresh. It happens with carrots that have been in the store, or cucumbers that you bought from the store, and it's, it's harmless. It's not going to hurt you, but that's the main reason that people have these problems. So um, don't be afraid um, to just don't use anything to push them down. Just watch them, and they might turn a little bit a different color because they're up above the air, but I give them all the time. It's great. You Fermentation is so safe, guys. I don't want you to be afraid. It is scientifically one of the safest ways to eat food. And um, you you just, you'll know. I've had one time I had culture vegetables go off, and holy cow, did I know it. They had a crack in the jar, so all this air got in, and they got black on them, mold on them, and they smelled, there's no way I would have ever eaten those. Those smelled so horrible. So I knew something was wrong. But I've been doing this 13 years. That's only one time that happened, and it's because it had a crack in the thing, and I didn't know it, the top. 
and it let all kinds of air exposure in, and my, and my cabbage was old. That was the other thing, too. So, but you will know. They will, be, they will taste sour, and you do not be, need to be afraid about, you'll know. And you'll, you'll know they just, they'll turn to sauerkraut. It's the safest way. There's so much good bacteria in there, especially if you use a culture. It dominates and controls the environment and preserves it. So always a uh, culture really does help. You don't have to use a culture to make cultured vegetables. It will make its own. And the reason I recommend a culture is because the bacteria stays at a higher level longer because it has food with the culture. Um, when you just, you know, culture, culture vegetables and you don't use a culture, the bacteria diminishes quicker because it um, doesn't have the extra bacteria in there that it adds to the culture. So I found that my, like for instance, these, these have been in here since the summer. Can you see that they're, they're bubbly? That's because I used a culture. Um, they have more bacteria, so the levels stay at a high level longer. And what's really is exciting is I really like Caldwell's. Um, they've come out with a new dairy-free version that should be out in four weeks. I cannot wait because we're, everybody's running out of cultured vegetables. I like Bodycology's cultured veggie stars, so I'm selling those on my site. Those are great, and I've used those for many years. I like Caldwell's better, but they're out of stock, and I can't do anything about it. But they're making a new version for dairy-free for people who don't want dairy, so that's going to be awesome. So excited about that. Okay, I have a bunch more questions. Um, I just explained about the fermenting lids. Let's see. What do I do with the voluminous kefir grains when only one person in the house is drinking kefir? I love them, but I have so many more that I can use at any given time. Well, tell me about it. <laughs> you, do, you get a lot. You know what I recommend? Take some of your kefir grains, and when you make a smoothie, put some in the blender and blend them up. They are really good for you, um, especially if you have a strong blender. You, and they'll just, they have anti-cancer properties in them, and they're really good for you. Chickens love them. Um, fish love them. Um, but you, they're good for you. So make sure your smoothie a little thicker, but if you blend them up, you can't taste them. But that's what I would recommend because these kefir grains are going to last through your children's, 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 children. They're going to last forever, especially if, if you've got healthy ones. If you, you've got mine, mine have lasted 13 years. Mine just keep, they're the, for grains that keep on ticking. So they just go from one, they've gone all over the world. It's exciting to me. So, and they will last forever. Because if you take care of them, you can't heat them and you can't starve them. Those are the two things that you can't do to keep for grains. And if you do, don't tell me because it traumatizes me. So, okay, let's see. What happens to the caffeine during the fermentation of kombucha tea? I have friends and family that are very sensitive to caffeine. Do I need to make it with decaffeinated tea? And what happens to the milk proteins in dairy kefir? Okay, so first of all, with the, um, the caffeine, when you ferment it, a lot of the caffeine is removed from kombucha tea. So when you, when you re, it reduces the amount of caffeine, but it does not eliminate it, but it does reduce it. For instance, I'm very sensitive to caffeine, and um, I will stay awake at night if I drink iced tea, you know, I have it uh, late at night or something. But I never have that problem with kombucha. I never, it seems to affect me. It doesn't uh, keep me up at night or anything like that. You can make it with decaffeinated tea. You can make it with, um, there's some ca decaffeinated teas on the market. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's R-O-O-I-U-B-S, B-U-S. Um, that's a good tea that's caffeine free. You can use white tea. You can use green tea has less caffeine in it or just decaffeinated if you need to. It all works. It will all work um, to make kombucha. Actually, I had somebody today ask me if you could use chai tea bags to make kombucha. And I told her that you could, but you need to make a separate pot for it and save some scoby and save some starter juice to make another one. You can't keep remaking that because some of the properties in those tea bags will affect your kombucha brew. So I don't recommend you using stuff with other spices and teas to make the initial. You can second ferment it but not to use the first one. So uh, let's see, what else we have? With your cultured grapes, what is the reason behind adding green onion? Can you leave it out? Yes, you can leave it out. Um, you can do whatever you want. I just put them in there because I like to put them on skewers, and I like to having the green onion on there. Uh, my fermented grapes, I don't know if you've seen those there in my book, they are so good. I call them cocktail grapes. And I put cinnamon and cloves in there and green onions, and they have a whole unique flavor to them. And they're super good if you put them on a skewer with um, some other 
fruit or veggies or even meats and cheeses, things like that. They're really fun, and people get such a kick out of them because they're kind of carbonated. So when you eat them, they kind of burst in your mouth a little bit, and people don't know what's just happened, but they're a lot of fun to take to parties. They're a lot of fun for people to eat them, and they have a really, really unique flavor that I really, really love. Let me see. Um, where can I get the starter with the white rim that you use? I make, uh, let's see, I make six take cups of kefir a day and it takes me about one hour. Is there a method you suggest? We're going to get the starter with the white rim that you use. Um, let's see, I'm not sure which one that she's talking about. We're going to get the starter with the right. I'm not sure which one you're talking about, but uh, your method um, to make six take cups, well, I make that much and more. I make gallons of kefir every day because I have to keep my kefir grains alive. And so I just have a huge glass bowl with a huge strainer. And I strain them through that. It doesn't take me more than 10, 15 minutes to do that. Um, it shouldn't take an hour. You're just straining the grains out. And then I stir them with a rubber spatula to get all the milk out through the strainer. And then I uh, scoop them back off and put them back in the jug and add fresh milk to it. It shouldn't take very long. And I'm not sure which one, what strainer you're talking about for sure. Um, but I, I'm not for sure which one that is. Okay, so let's see. What about, let's see, I have so many questions on here. Oh, hang on. I've got, what happens to, do you have a kombucha recipe that tastes similar to GT's Trilogy? You know, I haven't had that one for a while. I think it has ginger in it. You know, if I were you, I would look at the recipe on the back, because I can't remember for for instance, what's in it. I've made so much kombucha that I can't remember what I've done and what I haven't done. But that might be something I could look into to try to figure out. I really like that uh, that um, trilogy. I forgot that they had that one. That's a really good one. You know what's really good with that trilogy? I make some um, kefir ice cream and I, I pour the trilogy over it. I had it at a restaurant. They served that kombucha over some like sorbet what a great dessert that was. It was to die for. Um, I really, I really, really liked it. And it, it's a kind of a fun thing to have in the summertime is to pour a little bit of kombucha over some sorbet. And um, it'll be, it'll, it's, it's a lot of fun to come up with uh, recipes. And you can make like a, a root beer float. You put kombucha in with some kefir ice cream and, and uh, some root beer kombucha. And it will come out of the glass. It's so bubbly. When you combine kombucha with any kind of ice cream, it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's got tons of bubbles, tons of delicious things in it that you would really like. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things about um, some of the things that I do that I think would help you a lot. A lot of people will write me and say that their milk kefir is thin. And the number one reason that your milk kefir is thin, either it's not fermented long enough or it's over fermented. And most of the time, it's because your grains have grown and you haven't added more milk or your house is too warm. And kefir that is thick and creamy is usually in a cooler temperature with lots of milk. And if it separates into whey and curd, then you know you've over-fermented it, which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. It just means that you either need to add more milk or shorten your fermenting time, which you can do. You kind of got to get to where you start to know what's happening, and that is that when it separates into whey's and curds where you can see clear liquid then you know that you know you've fermented it too long it's still okay you can shake it up and drink it it's fine but the next time you just need to add more milk or shorten the time so that's another and to make it super creamy it likes the colder temperatures um, a little bit so it it does really well let's see how do chia seeds work with homemade kombucha have you done this yet Okay, well, let me tell you about this story. Um, homemade, to, to, when you do it with chia seeds, I noticed that when I drank the kombucha with chia seeds, it was sweet, really sweet. And the reason that that is is because those chia seeds absorb water and they hang on to the juice that's in kombucha. So you're not getting the reduction in the sugars, that you're getting more sugar in the kombucha that has chia seeds because they hang on to it. So I haven't been a fan of the chia seeds in the kombucha because I got more sugar. When you second ferment your kombucha, first you make your kombucha, 
regular, and then you add juice to it. Well, then you add chia seeds to it, and then the chia seeds, instead of fermenting the yeast, fermenting the juice and eating the sugars, the chia seeds hang on to it. And so you can do that homemade by just dumping them in there. You do it uh, on the second ferment when you add the juice, but it will have more sugar in it. So you might want to be aware of that. So that's one of that's one of the reasons why I don't particularly like that one. And if you have issues with candida or problems with that, I wouldn't recommend doing the ones with chia seed because they they have more sugar. So and that's not good for you when you have problems with candida. The other thing is that all of these foods work really well. I don't know if you've read a, the blog I wrote on um, how to uh, how to eat cultured foods with candida or candied and cultured foods was the name of the blog. And they are so effective for candida. And I did kind of a tough regimen when I had candida. Basically, you'll get a lot of die-off symptoms when you have candida, which a lot of people are experiencing yeast die-off more than they are bacteria die-off when they eat cultured foods. That's making them feel so bad. They're, it's pretty toxic, um, candida, when it dies off. And it does not go out without a struggle. And here's the cool thing about yeast. Um, candida is a form of, you know, it's a fungus, is a yeast. And when yeasts are inside of your body, which they are, you always are going to have that, and they want to decide who's going to dominate inside your gut, they shoot at each other with a liquid substance that's like, it's like a shootout in a cold corral, you know. And the ones that survive will, um, will stay and dominate. And so candida wants to put up a big fight. And so when it dies, it's really tough on you. So um, what the, I think is the best thing to recommend is to flood the body with tons of probiotics, and then it can't survive. However, that can be kind of uncomfortable because it's like a little battlefield going on inside of you. Like who's going to dominate? Who's going to win this world war down here inside of your body? And so, but... The more you have of these, the stronger they get, and the more they control the environment. But it can be very uncomfortable if you're not used to it, and I recommend going slowly, or I didn't go slowly. I just got it over with and uh, decided I was just going to take everything I possibly could, and I did, and I got rid of it. So it's up to you, but I'm a little bit more hardcore than the average person, so... And I was home, so I don't have a job. So I had access to, you know, being at home. So anyway, but I think I think it's important to know that the whole thing you're trying to do is establish a new ecosystem inside of you. One that none of us eating these foods anymore. Nobody's eating these cultured foods anymore because we've gone, everything's commercialized, everything's processed. And so there's a huge correlation in between the food we're eating now and the health that we're having because people are having so many health problems. I mean, I, I live in this world where I don't go to the doctor. I don't need to. We don't go. Our family doesn't go. Um, we don't be, because we're healthy all the time, and we expect to be healthy. And so it's it's just become a lifestyle for us, and that is not the norm today. And it shocks me because I forget that that's not the norm. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm here to tell you that that's how it's supposed to be. But it takes some doing. You've got to work with your body to do that. And you've got to establish a new base. And the best way to do that is with cultured foods. Not enormous amounts of cultured foods. Like a spoonful at a meal is huge. Like one spoonful of cultured vegetables with dinner is huge. Half a cup of kefir a day. A cup of kefir a day is a lot. That's I have that probably every day for lunch. I have some kind of crazy kefir thing that I make up. So, which is really fun for me. I mean, I'm... I posted a thing yesterday about I was cleaning out the refrigerator and made a smoothie with all the leftover stuff I have. So, um, and a culture, like four ounces of kombucha. I mean, we're, that's not a lot of cultured food. And that can make a huge difference in your life. As you start to change um, the bacteria inside of you, it helps you digest your other food. And then you start to want to clean up your life. I mean, your diet. That, that I call them my personal trainers because... I am not going to sit here and tell you you got to eat my diet, that you got to do my way or the highway. I mean, there's a lot of people out there pushing against a lot of things, like you can't eat this, you can't eat that, you got to do it this way, you got to do it that way, and I have tried them all, believe me. And none of them worked for me like this did. But I kind of needed the journey of those things. I needed to try all those different types of diets. 
because it taught me something I wouldn't have learned any other way. And now I'm a very normal person as far as I, I eat really good, but I don't eat perfect all the time, you know. I mean, we go out to eat and we have fun stuff and I just don't have to worry about it anymore because predominantly my diet is really good. But it wasn't always, you know. I mean, I was a diet coke addict and it was terrible some of the things I was addicted to. And it's so fun that your body starts to crave the foods that's good for it. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be wonderful if you could crave the things you were supposed to be good for you instead of craving the things that were bad for you? That is so exciting to me that I crave them, that it's not a struggle for me to reach for that because I want them. And so if you that, that changed all everything for me because before I, I felt like I was addicted to these foods, but they cause addictions and they cause you to crave them in ways because your body's not getting nutrients, processed foods, chemically laden foods, you're not getting nutrients, you're not getting any kind of um, nutrient dense or vitamins and minerals like you should because your body can't absorb them, so you crave more and more and more and more of them. Like for instance in Diet Coke, there is an incomplete amino acid in there. I can't remember how to, with the, I can't remember how to pronounce it, so I don't want to do it on a live broadcast because I'm sure I pronounce it wrong. My sister's a scientist, she would love to correct me. but. Um, there's an incomplete amino acid in there, and it makes your body crave it. It's like it has the same pathway to the brain as, as drugs do. And so you're constant. I was so addicted to it, I couldn't get off of it. And this was many years ago. Well, when I found kombucha, it detoxed me from it. And I, I just don't have any craving for it. And I literally was addicted to it. And what a difference that has made for me. I mean, think about it. If you could eat the foods that were good for you, and you wanted to, and you wasn't a struggle to say no. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I still do things that other people do. You know, every once in a while we go out and we have a good time. But I eat pretty good on a regular basis because I really do like those foods. And um, my body has let me know that this is what it likes. And by golly, if I want to feel this way, I eat them. And I enjoy. And so I made all these recipes because I want to enjoy my food because I'm a foodie. So it's. It's one of my favorite things is to help people not be afraid of these foods, to learn to love these foods, and to um, enjoy the benefits and enjoy a healthy life. So it looks like we're, go we're going a little bit over, um, and uh, I hope to do – hang on, I'm going to answer one more question real quick. Can you use lemon or lime to second ferment your kombucha? Yes. I wanted to say answer that one. Yes, you can. It's delicious. I just did it. It's so good. I have in my book, I have a margarita kombucha. It doesn't, it doesn't have alcohol, but it just has the lime juice in it and the salt. you got to try that. I wanted to tell you that. It's, it's really, really good. So thank you for joining me for my live broadcast and uh, coming into my home. I wish I could have every one of you guys over here because I made treats even though you can't come, so I just pretended you were coming. I have all kinds of things that I made, but um, I hope to do more of these, and I hope to actually have people come join me on the Hangouts. We wanted to do the first one, just me, to make sure everything went smoothly, but I would love to have some of um, you come and join me, because we can have like up to eight or nine people on the Hangout with me, asking questions, people could see them. It could be super fun, and we could start a whole revolution of changing people's lives of um, eating cultured foods and making it really fun on the journey. So I appreciate you joining me and hanging out with me. I hope to do it again and happy fermenting to everybody. You guys have a great weekend and a great Saturday.